All right, uh, what did, where did I leave off? Okay, okay, so let's talk about um, calculating uh, R, the correlation. Now I have to um, kind of preface this and say, today nobody calculates correlation by hand, okay? It's just like, you just don't do it, all right? However, I think if we calculate correlation by hand for a small data set, we understand where we're getting these values, okay? So that's why we're going we're gonna to learn how to do it, okay? <laughs> so, um, so basically, we can think of R, uh, the calculation of R is basically like 1 over n minus 1 times um, we calculate the z-score for x, and the z-score for y, we multiply these two things together, and we, uh, we add them up. OK? Now, what is the z-score? Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? It's like, uh, yeah. standard deviation, OK? So it's x minus the mean over the standard deviation, so actually, um, getting thrown off here. It's for a sample. It's going to be x minus x bar divided by s, and then we got y minus y bar divided by s. And I'm going to subscript s y and s x. This is for a sample, right? Yeah, this is for a sample, and this is what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, Pretty much uh, the standard deviation of x is going to be the same for all of our x values when we sum them up. The standard deviation of y is going to be the same for all of our y values when we sum them up. So I'm going to just uh, extract those. And I'm going to say 1 over n minus 1 times 1 over s sub x times 1 over s sub y. And this is multiplied by x minus x bar times y minus y bar. OK, so this is what we're going to use as our formula for calculating R, the correlation coefficient. OK. All right, so this is our pretend data, or uh, we might call this our toy data, just so we get the idea of how this works. All right, and then so we're going to see, um, I'm going to go to uh, we're going to look at the number of bedrooms in a house and the number of closets. OK? Is there a relationship between the number of bedrooms in a living place and the number of closets? OK. All right, so we're going to say you went to a one bedroom place and it had two closets. Um, and so this is, this is like the worst data set in the world. But um, it's good for just illustrating uh, this point here. So we're going to say, OK, you went to a place with one bedroom and it had two closets. You went to a place with two bedrooms and they had six closets there. And then another place with three bedrooms had four closets. And a place with four bedrooms had eight closets. Okay. So is there a relationship between bedrooms and closets? Okay. Well, let's, um, I'm going to plot these. One, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight. Okay, so I got a dot here, a dot here, a dot here, and a dot there. Okay. Um, okay, so to calculate uh, our correlation coefficient, let me actually give myself some space here. I do love having the digital chalkboard because <laughs> I can just do stuff like this. Um, OK. So I'm going um, to calculate uh, our x, our y. And then we're going to do x minus x bar, y minus y bar. And then we'll do the product 
of x minus x bar times y minus y bar. Okay, so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and y is 2, 6, 4, 8. Okay, what is, uh, what is the mean of x? What is my x bar? Shouldn't be too hard, right? 2.5, right? Okay, and then what's the mean of y? Y bar is 5. And do I have to do? Right, you just add these up and you get 10, and you divide by 4, and you get 2.5, and, and you add these up and you get 20, and you divide by 4, and you get 5. Okay, so x minus x bar would give me negative 1.5 x minus x bar here would give me negative 0.5. 3 minus 2.5 gives me positive 0.5. And 4 minus 2.5 gives me positive 1.5. Uh, OK, we do the same thing for y. 2 minus 5 gives me negative 3. 6 minus 5 gives me negative 1. I'm, I'm sorry, 6 minus 5 gives me positive 1. What am I talking about? OK, 4 minus 5 gives me negative 1. And 8 minus 5 gives me positive 3. And so um, if I multiply these together, what do I get? Negative 1 and a half times negative 3 gives me positive 4.5. This times this gives me, the next row gives me negative 0.5. And this row is also. And then the last row gives me positive 4.5, OK? All right, so I've calculated all of my x bar, x minus x bar times y minus y bars. And then I just have to add all of these up, right? So if I add all of these up, what do I get? I get 8. Is that OK? All right, and then, OK, and then so, uh, n minus 1 would be equal to, so it's how many, um, how many data points do I have? I have 4, so I'm going uh, to get 3 for uh, n minus 1. And then the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y, I can, uh, um, we'll just ask r for these very quickly, OK? So we don't have to calculate these ourselves. We could if, uh, if I made you, right? <laughs> OK, so I could say, what's the standard deviation of 1 through 4? OK, and I get 1.291. <coughs> and then the standard deviation of uh, basically 2, 6, 4, and 8 is going to be double that, 2.582. OK, and then so if I do all of this. R is equal to 1 over 3 times 1 over 1.291 times 1 over 2.582 times 8. This is, this is equal to our sum of x minus x bar times y minus y bar. I would get r is equal to 0 0.8. OK. Did I do that too quickly, or is, are we OK? Yes? You calculated the standard deviation into the regular standard deviation. Yeah, regular old standard deviation. Or is there another non-regular standard deviation? Uh, standard errors change from, from, oh, from test to test. But yeah, this is just like. Uh, uh, kind of the quote unquote average square distance from the mean square square root of that. So we, you know, you um, effectively effectively we would what would we be doing? We would take x minus x bar. We would square all of these, add them up, and divide by three, right? And then I would square all of these, add them up, and divide by three. And uh, and that's that's what we get. Okay. So uh, let me just kind of illustrate what's going on here. Um, what we have, if I, 
if I draw a line at two and a half, a vertical line at two and a half, and draw a horizontal line at five, okay, because, uh, you know, I got, oops, two, four, six, and eight. So I'm drawing a line where y equals five and a line at x equal to 2.5. This kind of gives us our central point, okay? And what we see is that this value, this guy is um, above, above x, okay? And it's also above, above the y bar, okay? So this value right here, 4, 8, is, uh, you know, one and a half above our average in x, and it's, and he's three units above our average in y, okay? So he has, you know, this value is positive and this value is positive, so his contribution, this, he contributes positively. This is a positive contribution. to r, okay? And then this guy is negative and negative, so when you multiply the negative times the negative, you get a, also a positive contribution to r. So this is a positive contribution. Okay, do we see that? Okay, meanwhile, these guys, these guys, this guy is below the average in x, but above average for y, okay? And this guy is above average x, but below average for y. So these are negative contribution. And this over here is also a negative contribution. Okay, and we can see this, right? So here we have the uh, kind of the positive and the positive, and over here we have the negative and the negative. But what do we see? We see the positive contribution is greater than the negative contribution. So overall, our calculation of r is going to be positive. Okay, so we get r is equal to 0 0.8. This is okay? All right. What if, um, what if I have like the exact same thing? Okay, but this time, um, what if I move my data points out to here? So I have uh, this guy moves out over here, and this guy moves out down here. So instead of two, uh, Two six, I have one two, and then this one becomes. Uh, so I'm going to erase erase these data points. So I'm going to I'm going to move these out, and so my data points are now going to be one and eight, and over here I've got four and two. What's my overall correlation going to be? Uh, it's going to be zero. Okay, so this, uh, because what we have is that the positive co contributions and the negative contributions, if I look at one and eight, again my x bar is two and a half and my y bar is five. Here I'm going to have a negative 1.5 and a positive three in here, I've got a positive 1.5 and a negative 3. Um, basically, our positive contributions and our negative contributions all cancel each other out. Okay, so our correlation for these data points is going to be zero. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically I'm saying I'm, I'm replacing these data points uh, and just pushing them out there. Okay. I mean, and, you know, my r is, you know, 1 over n minus 1 times 1 over s of x times 1 over s of y times the sum of, you know, so I, I multiply, 
basically how much bigger is x than the average of x, how much bigger is y than the average of y, and we're going to see is that, is that large or small, okay? So, you know, because just think back, what does it mean to have positive correlation? It means large x goes with large y, and small x goes with small y. So when you have large x going with large y, both of these are positive, and you have a positive contribution. And if small x goes with small y, both of these are negative, so you have a positive contribution. So, you know, positive r means large x goes with large y, and small x goes with small y. Okay, right? And we can see that the formula reflects that because large x means x minus x bar is positive and large y means y minus y bar is positive. Okay? And small x means x minus x bar is negative and y minus y bar is negative. Okay, so when you multiply negative by negative you get a positive, right? And then on the other hand a negative r means large x goes with small y so that means this is positive but this one is negative so you have a negative contribution and uh, small x goes with large y and you see so again you have a positive times a negative or a negative times a positive so you're gonna have a negative contribution to r and it's just kinda like when you do it for the entire data set who wins out okay do the positive contributions win out do the negative contributions win out that's what we're effectively asking. And, and that's how we decide whether we have a large or small um, correlation R. Is that OK? All right. So we also have a test to see if R is significant, OK? So we have a hypothesis test to see okay so uh, just recall our last data set we had x and y and one two three four and what was it two six four eight right and our thing looked like something like this Just making these up again. Okay, and we found that R is equal to 0 0.8. Okay, so the question is is this a significant amount of correlation? Okay, significant is different than just, you know, is, is this strong, right? So you know, we said you know, if R is large, you have a strong, strong relationship, and if R is negative, it's, I mean, if, if R is small, you have a weak relationship, and if R is positive, you have a positive relationship. R is, okay. The question here is, is R significant? Okay. What does it mean to be statistically significant? It's kind of this, a slightly strange term, but if we say something is statistically significant, that implies that we've rejected the null hypothesis, meaning our data is not a result of random chance, okay? So we want to know, could this correlation of 0.8 be a result of random chance, or is this evidence that there is a relationship between x and y, okay? Could our correlation of 0 0.8, of 0.8, be a result of random chance okay or does it provide evidence that a relationship exists in um, between X and Y in the population
Okay. So what do you guys think? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, well, we'll do the test, all right? So the, uh, the test statistic here is this thing, okay? So we have a test statistic, which is equal to r times the square root of n minus 2 divided by 1 minus r squared. Okay. n is the number of um, data points. Okay. Test statistic. It's a. Uh, it's like um, Fox and Socks. Have you guys read that book? It's a Dr. Seuss book. It's like Fox, Fox and Socks. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Yeah. <laughs> Life is hard. Okay. So we've got. Um, so we have this. Okay. So we're gonna um, plug this in. We're gonna plug in our correlation of 0.8. So our test statistic is gonna be 0.8 times the square root of 4 minus 2 divided by 1 minus 0.8 squared. So what is this? 0.8 times square root of 2 over 0.36. And what is that? OK. 2 divided by 0.36. What's the square root of that? Uh, times 0.8. OK, I get 1.8856. OK. And um, you would look this up, uh, use the t-table with um, degrees of freedom equal, how many degrees of freedom do you think we have? It's n minus 2, OK? And the reason, why are we subtracting off 2 when every other time we subtract off 1, OK? Well, um, if you think about it, if you only have two points, they're always going to form a straight line, OK? So it's only until you, if you add a third point, can you have can you test to see if um, you know the amount of scatter or the you know the correlation is actually significant or not. Okay, so we're going to look up uh, 1.8856, two degrees of freedom. Okay, so what do we see? Oh wow, we have uh, one of the very rare occasions where our correlation is almost exactly the. Uh, the number in the table here, okay? So we'll just we'll just say our our tail area is equal to 0 0.10, okay? Wow, that's like exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we're gonna say our tail area is equal to 0 0.10, okay? Um, oh, I uh, I'm I'm I have. I've done bad manners here. Um, we have to, um, I'm sorry, we needed to write our null and our alternative hypotheses first. I apologize. And, uh, and I didn't do this. OK, so our null hypothesis would be what? That there is no correlation in the population. OK, so our null, I'm going to write it in words, and then I'm going to write it in symbols. OK, so our null hypothesis will be no correlation exists between x and y in the population. Whoa. <laughs> um, I'm used to people like opening that door all the time. It's just like it happens. But <laughs> that was like like I was really excited to open the door. Okay, so no correlation uh, exists between x and y. Okay, and then the way we write this symbolically is basically we would say um, not r is equal to 0, but rho, which is the Greek letter for r, equals 0. Okay? So because Latin letters go with statistics from our samples that we observe, and Greek letters go with parameters in the population. Okay? Except the rho 
Do you guys know what the Greek letter Rho looks like? It looks like a P, okay? I, 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 I swear, it, it looks like this, okay? But this is the Greek letter Rho. This is, um, this is Rho, um, which is the Greek, Greek equivalent of R. And so, like uh, languages that still use the Cyrillic alphabet, um, when you see a P, like if you're looking at Russian, and you see the P, it makes the R sound, right? And the you know the Pi makes the P sound. So like when they say like Priat, it's like it looks like Pi P, but whatever. Okay, all right. And then so um, the alternative. We have you know our regular options of not equal to zero, greater than zero, or less than zero, right? So we'll do uh, not equal to zero. Okay. You want it greater than zero? No. You hate directionality. Okay. Because uh, here it just says, is there evidence that there's a relationship between x and y? It didn't say, is there evidence that there's a positive relationship? Okay, we could have asked that. And if we said, is there evidence of a positive relationship, we would have had rho is greater than zero. Okay. So anyway, uh, we look this up. We get uh, um, we get 1.886. We look that up, and we get our tail area is actually equal to 0 0.10. And then so if we double that, so you know just. So would our alternative be correlation? Yeah. So. He, our null would be that there is no correlation, and our alternative would be that correlation does exist. Okay, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, so um, be, so I'm using a not equal sign, so I will double, and I will say my p value is equal to twenty percent. Okay, just because I happen. Huh? Because I have a I have a non-directional alternative, a not equal sign. Have we done that before? Yeah, we have, right? With the regular t test. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, with the regular t test. Okay. So we're using the t table. So yeah, sorry. With the t table, the um, the the table gives you just the the upper tail probability, and then so you have to. Um, when you have a non-directional test, we double it. Huh? We've learned too much. Okay. That's that's normally a good thing. Okay. All right. Is this okay? So my p-value ends up being greater than twenty percent. All right. So. So we've done our, our math. We got our test statistic equal to 1.886, our degrees of freedom equal to 2, and our p-value is equal to 20%. Okay, our null was that there was no correlation, and our alternative was that there is some kind of correlation. Okay. All right, so what would we do with this p-value? We would say... So we would do not reject the null hypothesis. And so we would say we do or we do not have evidence for what? We do not have evidence that, and what do I fill in here? That there is correlation between X and Y in the population. Or between the number of bedrooms and the number of closets. Okay. Okay. Could there be a relationship between bedrooms and closets? The answer is yes, there could be a relationship. However, just looking at four data points is not enough evidence to conclusively say there is, okay? So 
there could be a relationship, and there most likely is. between um, bed, bedrooms and closets. Okay. But our data, basically just four data points, does not provide evidence that there is. What does it mean to get a p-value of 20%? Okay, This means that even if rho equals 0, so even if the, um, there is no correlation, even if there is no correlation, between x and y, a random sample of four data points could produce a correlation of 0.8 or more or negative 0.8 and less um, from random chance with probability 0.2. Okay, so another way to think of this is that if you gave me four darts blindfolded me and told me to throw these four darts at the wall, okay? When I throw them, they might form just a pattern of points that if I stuck them into the computer and said, give me the correlation of these points, about 20% of the time, the four darts that I throw at random will form a pattern of points with a correlation of 0.8 or more, or negative 0.8 or less. Does that kind of make sense? So okay. you have a twenty percent chance of throwing random darts and getting and and getting, and, and getting a point a correlation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you're just throwing four. Yeah. Okay. Just throwing, okay. You know, obviously, if we threw a hundred darts, it would be really hard to get a correlation of point eight at random. Okay. So with a hundred darts, your your p value would be very significant. Okay. OK, is that OK? All right. Um, OK, so now let's talk linear regression. <laughs> um, OK, so with linear regression, we are trying to fit an equation that summarizes the relationship between x and y. So how do we pick a line that's going to best summarize the relationship between x and y? So let's, uh, I'm going to just graph the same thing. So say 1, 2, 3, 4, and so what did I say? 2, so we're going to have use the same data points, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 6, 4, and 8 for x and y. 2, 3, 6, 4, and 8. Okay, so um, let me 
can take this. I'll copy this. Actually, I'm going to shrink this down. Okay, so I'm going to propose two candidate lines here, okay? One candidate line looks like this, okay? And then another candidate line, they're supposed to be straight, okay? And it's really hard to do. Oh, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm like proud of myself here. Okay. <laughs> All right, which, which is the better line, okay? This is, you know, what is the best fitting line? Okay, this is the question that we're trying to get after, okay? All right, and so I guess de depending on how you define what the best fitting line is, um, you could arrive at different solutions, okay? The way we're going to define our best fitting line is we're going to say we're going to find the line that minimizes the total sum of squared residuals. So I'm going to write this down, okay? So our best fit line Okay, is equal to what we call the least squares line. Okay, this is the line. This line will minimize the total sum of squared. residuals. Okay, so we have to define what is a residual then, okay? So the residual is equal to the difference, is the difference between the actual data point and our prediction for that data point. actual data point and our prediction for that point. Okay? And so we would we're going to define residual as e is equal to y minus y hat. Okay, this is the residual this is the actual value this is our predicted value okay um, another way to think of the residual is the residual is the vertical distance between the point and the prediction line. So um, can I flip to the next slide here? OK, so we're going to have, so these are our, uh, our points, uh, our candidate lines, OK? So this line, we're going to say this line has an equation y hat equal to 2x. And over here, our candidate line is y hat is equal to, let 
me do some math here. I think it's uh, 1 plus 1.6x. Let me just verify that. Yes. OK. 1 plus 1.6x. OK. Which line is better? OK, so what we're going to do is basically we're going to look up what is the residual for each of these data points, right? So our data points are x is 1, 2, 3, 4. Y is 2, 6, 4, and 8. OK. And I'm going to make a column for y hat. And I'll copy this over for the other one as well. OK, so if I use this, this thing, what is uh, the prediction for y hat when x is 1? We're going to predict it's 2, right? I plug in 1 for x, and I get 2. What is the prediction for y hat when x is 2? 4, right? I plug 2 into this equation, and I get 4. Okay. At 3, I'm predicting 6, and at 4, I'm predicting 8. Okay. So what are the uh, residuals? E is the difference between y and y hat. So my residual here is 0. Here I have a residual of 2. Here I have a negative 2 residual. And here I have a residual of 0. Okay. So here I've got no residual. My dot is on the line. Okay. Here I have a residual of 2. And here I have a residual of minus 2. What is my squared residual? I'm going to have 0. I will have 4, 4, and 0. Okay. And so the total sum is going to have, I'm going to have a total sum of 8 for my squared residuals. Okay. And I can kind of draw this by drawing little, uh, I can take each residual and turn them into a square. Okay, and so the total, sh like if I shaded this in, the total area of these squares is equal to 8. Okay, what about over here? If I plug in 1 over here, what is, what is my y hat? 0.6. If I plug in 2, what do I get? Uh, what's that? 3.2, 4.2. And over here, I would get 4.8 plus 1, 5.8. And 4 times x, 6.4, 7.4. Am I can. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 1.6, yes. Sorry. No, 2.6, 2.6. What am I talking about? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> okay, so I'm just plugging. I'm plugging in my value of x to get my y hats. Okay, uh, what are my um, residuals then, and what are my residuals squared? Here I have a residual of negative point six. I have a residual of uh, one point eight, negative one point eight and 0.6, okay? And so when I square this, I get 0.36. What's 1.8 squared? That's uh, 3.24. <coughs> okay. And then I add all of these up. Wait, I think that's what I get. Seven point two, yeah. Okay, so I add all of these up and I get seven point two. So to illustrate this, basically I'm just gonna take my um, distance from the prediction line and I'm gonna turn them into little squares. And 
And, you know, maybe my picture's not perfect, but according to our math, the total area here of these squares is equal to 7.2, okay? So because we have less area and the total sum of squares residuals, this is deemed the better line, okay? So the, uh, the total sum of the squared residuals are smaller here so this is the quote better line okay at least according to what we call the least squares criterion okay so if we're judging our lines based on least squares, this is the better line. Okay, well, how are we going to pick out other lines in the future when we have random data sets and stuff like that? So, um, so you could do calculus to arrive at this. Um, other people have done the work, and so this is what we call a solved problem, so we can just benefit from knowing how to get the slope and intercept of our best fit line. Okay, so um, the best fit line, or our least squares line, whoops, will have the following slope and intercept. Okay, so the equation of a line is going to be y hat is equal to b0 plus b1x. Okay, so b0 is our intercept, and b1 is the slope. Okay, so, you know, I think when you took algebra that you learned y equals mx plus b, um, we're calling them b0 and b1 rather than M and B, okay. So, and then and there's always a hat over the Y to indicate that this is our predict predicted value of Y. Predicted uh, value for Y. Okay, that's what the hat indicates. All right. So um, first, you're going to calculate the slope. The slope B1 is always going to have this property. R times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. Okay, So basically, you're taking the ratio between the standard deviation of y and the standard deviation of x, and that ratio is tempered by r. Okay, So if r equals 1, when you increase x by one standard deviation, we expect y to go up by one standard deviation, when r is equal to 1. So when you have a perfect relationship between x and y, here, wait, let me just write down the formula for intercept also, OK, before I get ahead of myself. So the intercept is b0, and that's going to be y bar minus b1 times x bar. So you've got to find the slope first. OK. So the slope is this and the intercept is this. OK, so our slope is r times sy over sx. OK, so if r is equal to 1, so a perfect relationship, OK, what that means is when we increase x by one standard deviation, we expect y to increase by one standard deviation also. Okay. That's if there's a perfect relationship, meaning if we can make perfect predictions for y based on x, 
meaning there's no scatter, that's how it's going to work. Anything less than a perfect relationship, how much we expect y to change is tempered by the correlation. Okay, So if r has a correlation of 0.9, when x increases by one standard deviation, we expect y to increase by only 0.9 of a standard deviation. Okay. Yes? Um, would that also refer to r equals negative 1? Yes. So we, but that would be if we increase x by one standard deviation, we expect y to decrease by so one standard deviation. Decrease. Yeah, if x was negative 1. I mean, if r is negative 1. Okay, because in, in, when you have a negative correlation, larger x goes with smaller y. So increasing x by a standard deviation would correspond to a decrease of x by one standard deviation. Okay. Anything else, so you know, if r is equal to 0.9, increasing x by one standard deviation, um, we expect y to increase by 0.9 standard deviations. Okay, But basically, to turn it into a slope, you just take the ratio between standard deviations. Okay, The intercept, uh, an interesting property of the intercept is that it will always cause the line to run through the point x bar, y bar. So it's always going to run through, um, this, would, this would be called the centroid of your data. Okay, Which kind of makes sense, meaning if, um, if you had data and somebody says, can you make a prediction for y? The x is completely average. If the, if the make a prediction for y when x is equal to the mean, your prediction for y will be the mean of y. Okay. If x is average, you would expect y to be average. OK, let's, um, let's talk about maybe some practical interpretations of the slope and intercept. Okay. So interpreting. Interpreting the slope. So um, basically, the slope is how much we expect y to change if x increases by 1 or, or 1 unit. Okay? And, uh, and expect is a key word here. So I think like in algebra, you, they kind of said slope is rise over run. I, I guess that's a good geometric interpretation. But as far as slopes in any other context, that's, it's kind of a terrible interpretation. If you're not talking about a geometry, it, it's not a very good interpretation. So what we had was we had y hat is equal to 1 plus 1.6x. Now what did? y represent in our data? What was that? Prediction of y. Well, it, well, y hat is our prediction of y, but what is, what is y hat? Or what is y? In closets, right? So y hat would be our predicted number of closets. Is equal to 1 plus 1.6. And what is x? 
bedrooms times their bedrooms. Okay, so our slope is equal to 1.6. And what this means is that if we increase the number of bedrooms by 1, our prediction for the number of closets goes up by 1.6. increase the number of bedrooms by 1, so that's equivalent to changing x by 1, we expect the number of closets increase by 1.6, okay? Of course, in actual data, the number of closets can either only go up by one or two or a whole number of a whole number of value. Okay, you're never going to observe 1.6 closets in a house. They're either going to have one closet or two closets or three closets. Okay, but this is our expectation, meaning that if we compare all the houses with one closet, or I mean, if we compare all the houses with this many bedrooms and then we compare them to houses with one more bedroom, and we averaged all the number of closets for houses with uh, whatever, houses with three bedrooms, and we averaged all the number of closets, and then we looked at houses with four bedrooms, and we averaged all the number of closets, we would expect that difference to be 1.6, okay? So we're talking about kind of the averages. Uh, and so it's okay to say we're expecting it to increase by 1.6 because this is kind of like the average of all closets with one, with one more bedroom. Number of closets of houses with one more bedroom. Okay. The intercept. So interpreting the intercept. Okay. This is what we would predict for y. if x were 0, OK? Now, we can't, um, it might not always make sense to plug in x 0, OK? So it does not always OK, and in that case, interpreting the intercept won't have a practical meaning. Okay, but over here, what this says is like if a dwelling has zero bedrooms, okay, we predict it will have one closet. So this is kind of like a studio, right? <laughs> Studio apartment, we're predicting it has one closet, even if it has no bedrooms or something. I don't know. Something silly like that. OK, so that's, that would be the interpretation of the, uh, the intercept. And in this context, it kind of makes sense. OK? But in another context, maybe we're trying to predict someone's height or someone's weight based on their height. OK? In that case, um, our x variable would be the height and you know, does anyone have a height of zero inches? No. Okay. It, nobody has a height of zero inches, and so therefore, you cannot make a prediction for someone's weight based on having a height of zero inches. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's what we have there. Okay. Let me just think. Uh, oh, oh. Okay. One more thing. All right. Sorry. All right, so last topic. OK, so r is correlation. We have um, r squared, OK? r squared, um, sometimes if you take r and you square it, this becomes r squared, OK? Well, at, at least for linear regression, OK? r squared is known as our, it has a fancy name, coefficient. Is that even how to spell coefficient of determination?
It's, it, just, just call it r squared, OK? If you say r squared, people know exactly what you're talking about, OK? But the official name is the coefficient of determination, OK? This basically tells us how much of the variation in y can be explained by the variation in x, OK? So I mean, that, that definition sounds terrible as well, OK? But uh, I'll try to break it down. How much of the variation in y is explained by the variation in x. OK, so let's say, um, you know, x is someone's height and y is the person's weight. And let's say r is equal to 0.6. And r, so r squared is going to be 0.36. OK? And this is what we have. OK, so what does it mean for r squared to be 0.36? OK, so the direct definition would be 36% um, of the variation in y, or variation in y a person's weight can be explained by the person's height. OK, so even still, what does that mean? All right. So what goes into determining a person's weight? This is not a rhetorical question. It's just like I'm just asking. And the answer is like a lot of things can determine a person's weight, right? Um, the person's diet, the person's genetics, whether the person is male or female. Um, and one of those things could be height, OK? So a person's height also goes into determining uh, someone's weight, OK? So there's lots of things, lots of factors that go into determining someone's weight, OK? Height would be one of them, or could be one of them. And if you include height in there, what we're saying is that about 36% of someone's weight can be explained by their height. But there's a lot of other factors that is not explained by the height. and. Uh, and so our co coefficient of determination, our R squared value, is 0.36. Okay, so we're saying lots of things um, factor in factor into determining a person's weight. Um, you know, diet, genetics, etc. Okay. Height is one of them. And this says that, you know, about 36% of a person's weight can be explained by height. That's what we're saying, OK? Now, if you include height and genetics and all of these other things, it might not be that with, with all of these other things, maybe the contribution or the amount that height explains is a lot smaller, OK? But um, because you know height might be related to genetics as well, OK, or it very much is. And so you know, when you include other things, the kind of the amount that height explains will probably decrease. But if height is the only thing going in being used to predict weight, what this says is that height explains about 36%. And the other 64% uh, 
at, because n there are no other factors in this model, we just have to say uh, is left to um, individual differences from person to person. Okay, and that's R squared. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much everything. So, um, so this is correlation. Uh, apparently, I haven't put up homework for Chapter 12, so I will do that. And uh, I'll see you guys next week, uh, where we spend uh, the we'll spend the session doing a review uh, and whatnot. Okay.